So uh, for most application, including uh, those in the field of geophysics, gravity is well approximated by Newton's law of gravitations, according to which uh, um, the strength of the gravitation is uh, proportional to the directly proportional to the products of the two masses that attracts and inversely proportional to their uh, distance. The Earth, like the other celestial bodies, is surrounded by its own uh, gravitational field uh, that corresponds to the uh, acceleration of the bodies undergoing this, uh, this field. The value of the gravity acceleration of the Earth is equal to the standard value, it's equal to 9.8 uh, meters per square uh, centimeter per square second. Sorry. Um, the Earth's gravity acceleration is supposed to be constant, but there are small changes over both space and time. Uh, we normally use in geophysics the microgal as the measurements unit, which is 10 raised to minus mm, 9 g. Changes of a space occur due to the different elevation of the observation points and the different uh, uh, latitude also. And also, because of the distribution of masses is not as the uh, standard model of the Earth. While changes of a time may occur because of tidal effects, also because of uh, mass displacement in the underground or changes in the elevation of the observation point. Here you can see that the changes in times are very small, of the order of 10 rise to minus 7 g, while changes in space are, are larger. So to observe these small changes, we need very precise instruments. Gravimeters usually measure the vertical component of the gravity acceleration, and we have basically two types of instruments relative instruments and absolute instruments. The relative instruments can measure the uh, difference of gravity between pairs of points, or in time, um, referring to a starting arbitrary time. While with these instruments, it's not possible to measure the real uh, value of the gravity acceleration in, at uh, one point. Through absolute gravimeters, this is possible. So we can measure the real value of the gravity at the observation point. So in geophysics, we can uh, uh, do measurements of a space to image the distribution of masses in the underground, or we can uh, measure time changes of gravity. So we can, uh, we can see how uh, the distribution of masses changes with time. Uh, gravity measurements over space, we talk uh, normally about static gravimetry. Uh, this observation must be corrected for different effects in order to, to get uh, values that we can invert and that, that we can interpret afterwards. So we need adjustments for time variation and adjustment for variation of the space. Effects, time effects are basically the instrumental drift and the tidal effects, the effect due to uh, the attraction of uh, basically moon and sun. While over space, we need to correct for the difference in position of the different points, both latitude and uh, elevation or effect due to the different distribution of uh, overground masses around the observation points. So our tides are due to the attraction basically of uh, uh, moon and sun. And you can see here, here we have the uh, model of uh, the tidal effect at Etna and Kilauea during uh, about 20 days in uh, 2013. You can see that there is an effect up to about uh, 250 microgals, and it, it's naturally different depending on the position of the observation point. As for effect uh, of a space, so we must correct if we have an observation point here, 
since it's at a different elevation with respect to the reference, we must correct for this different elevation. And this is uh, due normally using a standard uh, gradient, which is this one, free air gradient. Also, we have to correct for the fact that between the observation point and the reference, there is not uh, a void, but there is some mass. So a first order correction is done through the Bouguet uh, correction, which uh, assumes the presence of uh, an infinite slab with an elevation which is equal to the difference in elevation uh, between the observation point and the reference. And so the standard value of this correction is this one. And also we have to correct for the fact that we have masses in excess and uh, in defect with respect to the uh, Bouguet plate. And so this is called uh, uh, terrain corrections. Once all these corrections have been performed, we, have, uh, uh, we can uh, develop our Bouguet map, which is a map now only reflecting uh, uh, the distribution of density below the surface. So this is the Bouguet map for Etna, which has been developed using the data published by um, Schiavone and Lodo in 2007. And here you can see that you have two main components, a regional component with this trend here, which is mainly due to uh, very deep structures. And also there are some residual anomalies, like this one here or this one here which are due to shallower uh, structures. We are usually interested more in the residual anomalies, so the regional field is usually filtered out through different techniques. And for example, if we invert for, for Etna these uh, uh, Bouguer anomalies here, we get these maps. So these are maps of the density distribution with respect to uh, uh, medium value, reference value, which has been chosen by the people who did this, uh, this inversion. And so we have uh, density in excess or in defect with respect to this uh, um, uh, reference value. So here we have density maps for two elevations, uh, two and four kilometers below the sea level. And here we can see that there are many um, density anomalies in this map. One of these is this one, this density high, which is uh, in the southern part of the Valle del Bove here. And we can see it also here. It's interesting because the same anomaly is also found in the seismic tomography. You can see it here and here, same elevation, so with the same, more or less the same features. So this uh, gravity high corresponds to a high velocity body, which is uh, actually a, a plutonic body at uh, an elevation uh, between uh, two and more or less uh, eight kilometers below the sea level. Another application of uh, static gravimetry is this one coming from uh, Piton de la Fornese. Here the, these authors uh, made a detailed profile uh, across the lava flow that was produced by the 2007 eruption. And this study was done because uh, before reconstructing the roads, the local authorities wanted to know where there, were, where there was the possibility to have some uh, tunnels in the lava, uh, because this could be a danger for the people involved in the, in the, in the work, because uh, there could be uh, a problem to work with uh, very heavy machines over the parts of this lava flow where there could be some void. So, the authors made this uh, uh, study, and uh, through gravity they could uh, uh, identify uh, zones uh, where it was uh, likely the, the, the presence of, uh, of a tunnel. So switching to changes in time, this is a, <coughs> a scheme by, uh, by Torge, which can be found in this book by Torge, published in uh, 1984. And uh, here you can see that uh, among the different processes that can induce time changes, non-tidal time changes, volcanic processes are among the ones that can induce uh, stronger uh, 
changes over time in gravity. You can see that uh, we can have uh, uh, some, uh, some hundred of uh, microgauss changes. And uh, this book was, uh, was published in uh, 1984. And uh, here they say that uh, the, the period of these uh, changes could go between one day and uh, a few years. But actually, later studies demonstrate that uh, we can have also changes of a time scale shorter than this and uh, down to a few minutes, actually. So um, gravity anomalies depend on the characteristic of the source. And we can have uh, a great range of possibilities as uh, uh, wavelength of the gravity changes, periods, and amplitude. The amplitude and um, wavelength depends on the mass involved and the depth of the source, while the period depends on the evolution speed of the process involved in the, in the change. And so since this period can, can uh, range between uh, minutes and uh, actually years, we perform both continuous measurements and uh, time-lapse measurements. Time-lapse time measurements at active volcanoes are usually uh, performed through spring gravimeters, so relative instruments. And so each campaign is referred to uh, reference points. This is the uh, gravity network of Mount Etna. And you can see that here we have uh, reference points. So all the measurements are referred to this point where we assume that uh, the changes induced by the activity of the volcano are very small. And uh, then the, since the campaign are repeated uh, every few months or even years, these kind of measurements are normally used to uh, uh, detect uh, changes over uh, long time scales. So usually changes over long time scales are, um, are related uh, to processes that also induce pressure changes. So usually um, these kind of gravity changes are interpreted together with the formation. And uh, one of the most used uh, forward uh, models, analytic formulation, is the Moggy model to interpret uh, jointly uh, gravity and deformation. And this model uh, predicts that the uh, ratio between uh, variation of gravity and uh, variation of elevation is uh, it's linear. There are other models that are used to invert jointly gravity and uh, deformation changes. For example, the analytic expressions uh, proposed by Yokada and Okubo can account for the effect uh, of a uh, tensile fault, uh, while the model proposed by Okubo can be used to, uh, to predict the, the effect of uh, intrusion in uh, a fractured zone, because this model accounts for uh, intrusion inside the uh, uh, pattern of uh, uh, small cracks, which are uniformly distributed inside this narrow uh, fractured zone. So these models uh, do not predict a simple linear relation between uh, deformation and gravity. So usually, the, when we assume that the uh, gravity changes and the deformation are due to processes involving uh, the dynamic of the uh, Moggy source, we can use this framework, this scheme, to assess the likelihood and also the type of uh, volcanic activity. So if uh, um, the ratio between uh, gravity changes and uh, elevation changes cluster <coughs> along this line, the bouquet corrected Fier gradient, we are in, uh, in a situation where there is a pure mechanism of <coughs> um, magma intrusion. And this has been seen several times. For example, in this case, in the case of the uh, Iso volcano in Japan, 
during this uh, arrest, uh, during this uh, eruption phase in between uh, 1998 and 2000, we had very strong gravity and uh, elevation changes. And the, the ratio between gravity and uh, elevation cluster actually uh, around this uh, bouquet corrected free air gradient. So we have, uh, in this case, the intrusion of magma with a density very close to what uh, is expected, 2.4 grams per uh, cubic centimeter. In other cases, we have uh, uh, that the points are clustered somewhere between the two uh, lines, the bouquet corrected free air gradient and the free air gradient, so somewhere here. And this can occur because of two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, uh, we can have that uh, the uh, arrest process is uh, driven not by only magma, but by magma plus gases. So we have, in this case, uh, that the density of the material is lower than expected. So we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have points clustering along this line, but rather points clustering in this space here. Otherwise, we could have a situation like this one, where the arrest process is driven by hydrothermal fluids. This is a case referring to the arrest phase between 80 and 1980-1984 at Camp Ife Grey. And this arrest phase was found to be, um, to be due to a material with a density between 0.1 and uh, around 1 gram per uh, cubic centimeter, so a density much lower than magma. And so this result, uh, these results uh, point to the migration of uh, fluids in the hydrothermal system rather than uh, intrusion of magma. In other cases, uh, we have that uh, uh, the volume of magma, which is uh, deduced from the study of deformation, can account uh, only for a small portion of the uh, volume of magma which is needed to explain the, the gravity changes. Like in these cases, in this case here, uh, these are measurements from uh, Kilauea, measured uh, between uh, 2011 and 2012. And here you can see that uh, the volume of magma deduced from deformation can account for less than 10% of the mass addition that we need to explain the, um, the, the gravity changes. So even though we have uh, the pattern of deformation and gravity are well correlated in our space, we have this discrepancy. So we must assume some kind of mechanism able to induce uh, bulk mass changes without volume changes, like, for example, sus sus substitution of uh, uh, less dense magma with uh, magma with the higher density, or filling of uh, open spaces around the magma chamber. So this concept of excess mass uh, also works in cases of uh, deflation. Here we have a situation where the deflation, the, the, the volume uh, during a phase of deflation at Askia volcano in Iceland, the deduced from uh, deformation is much less than the mass decrease that we need to explain the gravity changes. And so we, the, the explanation given by these uh, authors was that uh, a part of the, of the volume uh, needed to explain the, the gravity change was actually due to this volume change was actually uh, compensated by the formation of, uh, of uh, gas bubbles inside the, the magma chamber. We also have cases where the gravity changes are the, on, the only change that we have. So we have strong gravity changes without deformation, uh, which is comparable with these uh, gravity changes. Like in this case here, this case referred to the uh, the changes which were observed between 1990-1991 uh, at Etna. And uh, so these are changes observed before uh, the 91-93 eruption. And so we have very strong gravity changes uh, associated with uh, very small deformation and uh, deformation uh, with a pattern which is uh, not in keeping with the pattern which would be associated at this, to this uh, gravity change. 
And so in this case, the author concluded that the gravity changes were, were due to intrusion of magma along uh, pre-existing open uh, voids, in particular uh, along uh, uh, fracture here, so from the uh, central conduit uh, going uh, towards the uh, southeast. There are also cases where uh, we can have uh, that the gravity changes are not directly related to the dynamics of, uh, of magma. Uh, at Etna, between 94 and 2001, we observed the strong changes uh, which were associated to a source in the southeastern sector of the volcano, a quite shallow source about uh, two kilometers below the sea level. Mm -hmm. So we have positive, both positive and negative gravity changes. And uh, the negative phase are associated with uh, a stronger release of uh, seismic energy. And this seismic energy was released uh, uh, from a volume which uh, it's in the same position as the volume as the gravity source, actually. So here we compared the gravity change at one station around here in time with the strain release, which was reduced for, for a linear trend and also was multiplied by a negative coefficient here. So we can see that there is a strong coupling between gravity and uh, strain release. This is actually anti-correlation because uh, we multiplied uh, uh, the strain release by a negative uh, factor. So we have a situation where gravity changes occurred in a volume which is separated from the volume where uh, the pressure source deduced from the formation was, uh, was placed. So we have a pressure source which is in the northwestern sector of the volcano at, uh, and is actually deeper than the, the gravity source. So the interpretation that was given was that these uh, gravity changes were due to changes in the rate of uh, microfracturing along the uh, pre-existing uh, fractured zone in this position here. And also in this paper, we, in this uh, paper here, we propose that uh, when a structural link formed between uh, the press, press, uh, pressure source and this uh, fractured zone, <coughs> Uh, the magma used this uh, fracture zone to reach the surface, and uh, there was the breakout of the 2001 eruption. So this is a quite uh, complicated framework where we have uh, um, a deeper pressure source uh, beneath the northwestern flank of the volcano, giving the deformation, the most of the deformation observed during the period, while the gravity and uh, seismicity were mainly driven by changes in the rate of uh, fracturing along this fracture zone here in another position. <coughs> and this mechanism worked until the breakout of the 2001 eruption. And so we think that this eruption actually changed this, uh, this kind of framework somehow, because we didn't observe this, uh, this pattern of changes anymore after this uh, eruption. So switching to uh, continuous gravity changes, um, so continuous gravity measurements, these uh, measurements are usually done through spring gravimeters. And because of uh, some limitation of these instruments, uh, uh, they don't uh, give high quality data over periods longer than, say, some days. This is because these instruments are affected by many parameters, mainly by temperature, and also they are affected by instrumental drift. Here we can see uh, quite long records from Etna and Kilauea. Mm -hmm. And we can see in both cases we have uh, uh, quite linear uh, drift over the, the record. And also, the, both uh, records are modulated by the seasonal uh, component of uh, temperature. So if we use a good setup with a suitable uh, protection against temperature, 
we can we can limit this effect, and in many cases we we observe that the strong correlation. This is uh, analysis in frequency domain, and you can see that the high correlation is only f found over the lowest part of the spectrum. So we have a period range which is free from temperature effects, and the period range which is uh, affected by these uh, temperature changes. And uh, so this uh, period range is uh, up to some days. So that's why uh, most of the past studies about uh, continuous gravity changes are focused on processes occurring on over short time scales. So the processes able to induce changes of uh, uh, these time scales are processes related to uh, the dynamics of uh, involving uh, magma and gas in the upper part of the plumbing system of a volcano. And we can have uh, different processes. Here we can see some, only some of them. For example, if we have a big slug freezing along the conduit, we will have actually um, a body with a very low density uh, being uh, progressively closer to the observation point where we will observe uh, gravity degrees. Also, if we have uh, accumulation of the foam layer in a position uh, relatively close to the observation point, also in this case, we will have uh, gravity decrease. We will observe a gravity decrease. And also fast magma movements in the conduit or along a rift zone, depending on the position of the observation point with respect of the uh, magma moving, will give uh, a, a change with uh, a positive or negative signal. Uh, also, the, mix, the mixing of magma with uh, different uh, densities uh, can give uh, gravity changes. This is a study where the authors simulated the uh, uh, mixing of magma in, uh, in a shallow magma chamber. And you can see that in different cases, at different distances between the axis of this magma chamber, we will have uh, uh, gravity changes over periods as short as uh, a few minutes, let's say a few tenths of minutes. So uh, the first case of study uh, comes from uh, Kilauea, uh, where in uh, uh, 2011 there was an, an eruption along the East Rift, Rift Zone, about 10 kilometers from the summit uh, active vent. This is a case uh, very similar to what uh, Claude Jobar was uh, talking about yesterday, because uh, there was a sudden decrease in the level of the lava lake here in the summit crater. And soon after this uh, sharp decrease, there was uh, the eruption. So the idea is that the magma, the eruption tapped the magma from the central conduit. And that's why we observed this uh, sudden decrease in the level of the uh, lava lake. So we have many data about uh, this, uh, this process. So we have data coming from a gravimeter that was installed very close to the lava lake, only 150 meters. And also we have the images from a thermal camera here in the edge of the, of the crater and looking at the surface of the, of the lava lake. So these are two images coming from this uh, thermal camera. And so the, this movie is a movie where we uh, synchronized the images from the uh, thermal camera with the, the gravity change. Uh, so the, we have a difference in time because this is uh, Hawaii local time and this is G GMT time from, from gravity. And so we can see that as soon as we have a decrease in the level of the lake, we will have a decrease also in gravity at the same time. Which is quite uh, impressive. Mm -hmm. 
And so afterwards, the gravity reaches a new level, which is uh, more or less uh, 150 microgauss uh, lower than the previous level. Are the very short period fluctuations of gravity real? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, they are real if you consider that the gravity is uh, at the same time uh, measures uh, gravity <laughs> acceleration and uh, inertial acceleration, so it behaves as a, a seismometer, basically. <laughs> so since there was uh, some seismic activity also, uh, we have, uh, yes, it's true, we have, uh, for example, this one is an earthquake. Can you correct for that? Yeah. We don't need to correct for that, because uh, the only information we need at this time is uh, just the development of the degrees. So you can see also that there is uh, this noise here which is uh, higher than the noise here is because of the eruption. So I guess it's, be, uh, it's because of the transferring, of this magma transferring from the central conduit to the rift zone. So that's why we have this increase in the background noise. So what we did, it was to um, try to invert the, the, the gravity data to find the density of the material inside the upper part of the vent. And to do that, we used the <laughs> numerical model of the vent, taking into account its uh, real shape. So using this model uh, and uh, the images from the thermal camera, we could calculate the gravity effect due to a change in the level of magma of lava inside the, the vent. So basically, we have. Uh, uh, gravity here, lava level, uh, deduced from the images of the thermal camera, and here is GPS. So we corrected the gravity for this, uh, also for this deformation, which accompanied the, the decrease in the, in the lava level. And so to get a good fit between observed and uh, calculated gravity, we had to use a very low density a density which is actually lower than water. And that means that uh, this uh, upper part of the system is actually uh, very rich in, uh, in gas, in gas bubbles. More than half of the material inside its, uh, its gas. This analysis uh, was extended uh, over a much uh, longer period, about four years. So here you can see uh, lava level, ground tilt, and GPS, and also gravity. You can see that uh, lava level and tilt are, and also GPS are, are very similar to each other, they are very correlated, while gravity doesn't seem to be correlated because of uh, other effects like temperature and uh, uh, the effect of uh, uh, instrumental drift, etc. Even though we correct for the seasonal part we still don't see any, uh, any coupling between gravity and lava level. But actually, if we go to shorter periods, for example, these two ones here, we can see that uh, actually there is a quite uh, close uh, coupling also between gravity and, uh, and lava level in the two cases. So we used the um, uh, wavelet coherence analysis to try to calculate the uh, correlation between ground tilt and uh, lava level. And here you can see that uh, there is a very strong correlation of uh, um, wavelet scales that correspond to periods between about one day and uh, a few months. And the, uh, these uh, arrows here point uh, to, towards the right means that uh, this is a uh, an in-phase uh, correlation. So there is no time delay between uh, lava level and tilt. Also, we performed the correlation analysis of a uh, 15 days window running uh, along the signals. And the results shows that the uh, ratio between lava level and tilt is quite constant in time. And the average is uh, 0.17, which means uh, um, about uh, five to seven meters uh, per uh, of uh, lava level for microradiant. 
The same analysis was performed between gravity and uh, lava level. And uh, here we can see again that uh, the correlation is not as good as before because of the uh, perturbations uh, of the gravity signal, but still we have some correlation in some times. And also in this case, in the correlates, uh, correlated part of the diagram, we have the in-phase correlation. We also performed this, uh, an analysis of uh, this, uh, the same, uh, same time window. In this case, uh, for each step of the window, we calculate the density needed to explain the gravity changes, uh, considering that uh, all the gravity change was due to the change in the lava level. So what we get is that the apparent density seems to increase during this period from a value of about uh, 1 to a value to about, uh, of about 1.5 gram per cubic centimeter. And so this could be an actual, uh, an actual um, change in density of the Ys uh, could be due to the fact that uh, the size of the event was increasing. Because here, actually, we are measuring not a real uh, change in density, but uh, rather an increase in the, in the mass involved in, in the process. So it could be a real density, but also it could be the fact that the event was, uh, during this period was actually uh, getting uh, larger. Well, apparent density means that uh, uh, we did this, did this calculation. We actually uh, tried to calculate the best density uh, that can fit our data. But uh, we are using always the same model for the vent. So if, for example, there is a difference in the geometry of the vent, this means that this, this is not real density. It's uh, a change in the, in the mass involved in the same uh, change of level. So it means that we are not measuring a change of a time of density. We are measuring a change of a time of the mass involved in the same change of level. So that's uh, the sense of this uh, apparent density. So if it's uh, interesting to see that if we combine the two equations, the equation for the lava level change and the equation for radial tilt, assuming a Moggy source, we see that uh, our ratio, the ratio we found before, depends on, uh, <coughs> on the density of the material inside the conduit. It's also related to the dimension of the magma chamber and also the position of the magma chamber itself. <coughs> and so if we use the value we found for the ratio and for density, uh, we find that the other parameters are, are as expected from uh, previous publications. And so this means that uh, at least of the time and space scales <coughs> that uh, we consider that the system behaves uh, elastically. Other data from, uh, from Kilauea. Um, yeah, we can see that uh, uh, we have data from these two stations, one very close to the, to the active vent, the other one about two kilometers from the, from the vent. And so this is the signal acquired uh, in uh, May 2000, 2010. And we can see that uh, the wavelet transform of the signal shows two main components. One is this one with a period uh, <coughs> of about uh, 30 seconds. And the other one is this one with a period of about uh, 150 seconds. So this is, this is uh, basically seismic noise, while this component here that we can see in this, uh, in this uh, chart here, which is actually a zoom of this part from the two signals, which has been filtered around uh, uh, 6.7 milliards. And we can see that uh, there are these oscillations were co very well correlated between the two instruments. The amplitude, it's, uh, it's larger in the instrument which is closer to the, uh, to the vent, to the active vent. And so considering this ratio between the amplitude of the oscillation at the two observation sites, we have that uh, the, the source can be, again, the 
uh, shallow magma source be, uh, beneath the northwestern, northeastern part of the of the Alemanwau crater. And so we proposed that uh, this uh, oscillation were due to <coughs> density inversion related to convection inside the shallow magma, magma chamber. So assuming uh, that uh, the convection was uh, driven by thermal instabilities, uh, we did some calculation uh, relating the time scale of convection to, to the position inside of the reservoir. And this calculation suggests a temperature contrast, which is in keeping with the density gradient that we need between upper and lower part to explain the gravity changes that we observed. So the last uh, cases, case of study comes from Etna, uh, where in uh, the summer of 2011, we installed uh, a gravity meter very close to the summit craters at a distance of about one kilometer from the summit craters. And during this, uh, the period of the installation, there were uh, a sequence of uh, uh, nine uh, lava fountains from this crater here, the new southeast crater. So there are many past studies that uh, propose that uh, these lava fountains at Etna are triggered by the collapse of the foam layer that accumulates somewhere in, uh, in a shallow position, probably at the roof of a small magma chamber, which is uh, at uh, shallow depth beneath the Summit Brothers. And so we observed uh, before each fountain, we observed the gravity decrease at uh, this station, uh, very close to the, to the Summit Brothers. And so we proposed that this gravity decrease could be due to the accumulation of a foam layer, or this foam layer in this, uh, in this position here, in the uh, top of this uh, magma chamber. And actually, this uh, gravity decrease occurs uh, during the phase of the Strombolian activity preceding the development of the lava fountain. Here, we don't, we don't have uh, data during the lava fountain because the volcanic tremor is too high. And so gravity data are uh, impossible to use because they are too, too noisy in this part here. So an overview of what we have seen. So long-term gravity changes uh, are usually uh, interpreted together with the ground deformation. And uh, uh, by coupling gravity and deformation, we can have uh, more information about the, the processes which are driving the, the arrest of the eruption. In particular, we can, uh, we can have information about the density of the intruding material, which is important because we can distinguish between uh, magma versus uh, hydrothermal uh, processes. Um, or also we can uh, detect processes uh, that induce uh, mass changes without uh, deformation, like in the case when magma moves through open fissures in the upper part of the plumbing system. Or we can detect uh, complex uh, processes involving, uh, beside the direct effect of magma, also second order effects like uh, changes in the rate of fracturing of the, of the medium. Using continuous measurements, we can assess uh, short-term uh, changes that are related to the shallow dynamics involving uh, magma and gas in the shallow part of the Planck system of open conduit systems. And from, mag from uh, gravity, we can have information about uh, gas segregation, for example, uh, possibly leading to explosive events like uh, we have seen uh, lava fountains or uh, density inversion related to uh, convection or rapid transfer of magma from the conduit to the uh, lateral rift zones. And that's all. Thanks.